Hi, in this presentation, I will be discussing the use of disposable ventilated cages to maintain germ-free and notobiotic mice without contamination. These experiments were carried out at Oregon State University at the notobiotic core, and we use the Innovive caging system. Notobiotics is derived from the root words notos for known and biota for life, and this also includes germ-free mice. Our main goal here is to understand the role of microorganisms in health and disease, and for this reason we use notobiotic mice. Normally they're kept in germ-free isolators, but when space is an issue, and if you are interested in more than one microbe, then this can get difficult. It can actually be very cost-effective using the right caging system to maintain mice outside of the isolator. This can also be, be very sustainable due to the fact that you can use the isolator for its intended purpose to breed more germ-free mice and then house your notobiotic experiments in an outside caging system. And if you use the right caging system, you're able to have complete bioexclusion and biocontainment. In our lab, we successfully kept cages germ-free using the Innovive Disposable Caging System. Our primary goal was to maintain cages germ-free, and in doing this, we can then use the procedures to maintain mice with any notobiotic status. We were also able to have complete biocontainment and bioexclusion due to the fact that there is a tight seal between the lid and the cage. This, along with the help of the dual HEPA filter, at the cage and rack level allowed, it to, allowed us to maintain cages germ-free. We did make one slight modification to the caging system, and this was to use an autoclave stopper with a ballpoint tube at the end, and this just helped reduce the backflow of any debris, as well as prevent water from leaking during transportation or when cages were taken in and out of the rack during health checks. In order to keep all cages and supplies sterile, everything was handled inside a biosafety cabinet class two. All supplies were sprayed before they were introduced into the biosafety cabinet and all cages were sprayed as well. And this was done with the help of a second person that would introduce all supplies or cages inside the cabinet while the sterile person would do all the cage changes and manipulate all the supplies. This type of uh, biosafety cabinet provides protection for the mice uh, if the goal is to keep them germ-free, as well as personnel if we are working with microorganisms that are potentially harmful. During the time that the cages are kept on the rack, we want to know if there are any bacterial contaminations present and to also determine when it was contaminated. In regular node biotic units, we do bacterial cultures as well as 16S ribosomal RNA, PCR amplification. And in the IVCs, we just used PCR amplification just because we could collect fresh stool pellets from each mouse during the change out. Also, uh, PCR amplification could be done to determine what bacteria actually contaminated the IVC, and sometimes bacterial cultures are not as sensitive. Two major contamination routes can include through supplies as well as the aseptic technique. For this reason, all of our supplies are either irradiated or they're autoclaved, and the supplies are all handled inside a biosafety cabinet. To detect the bacterial contamination, we perform PCR amplification using DNA that was extracted from fresh stool pellets. The fresh stool pellets were collected from each mouse in a cage during the changeouts, and all samples were extracted and set up for PCR under a biosafety cabinet to keep them sterile. In the graph that we have here, we show the different values from the DNA extraction in the samples, and they can range anywhere from one to five nanograms per microliter. It is interesting to note that mice on antibiotics can give us values within these ranges, and this doesn't tell us if there's an active contamination, it's just DNA that was extracted from, from the sample. For this reason, we need PCR amplification to determine if there is an active contamination 
or if the DNA that we're seeing is just from host or killed bacteria that was in the autoclave chow. In order to detect a bacterial contamination in our IVCs, we used a sensitive PCR using universal bacterial primers. And the reason for this is because if there is a product that was amplified, we could then sequence it to determine the source of the contamination. We tested two different primers from two different papers that were successful in detecting contamination in their notobiotic units. And these two primers worked really well for us. And with these two primers, we were actually able to detect a contamination in our first experiment during the four-week time point. And this could mean that there was a possible contamination during the first change out at the two-week time point. After our first experiment, we actually modified our protocol to include using autoclave sleeves when handling cages, as well as spraying our hands more often in between each item. And this allowed us to keep cages germ-free up to 12 weeks. And we did two other experiments after our first experiment, and they, all kept, they were all kept germ-free. So the, the changes in our protocol actually helped. For our protocol, cages were changed every two weeks. And at that two-week time point, we would change the water bottle, change the cage bottom, and we would collect fecal pellets at the cage level for 16S PCR to confirm sterility. And every four weeks, we would change the filter top, as is the norm in our facility. To have complete biocontainment and bioexclusion, we needed to handle cages inside a biosafety cabinet. Also, the supplies that were not being used uh, were kept inside a wrap bottom that had a special filter media. And this filter media is the same one that is used to keep germ-free supplies that would be later introduced into the isolators. Before any supplies are introduced into the biosafety cabinet, they are sprayed down outside by the assistant. And once they, the supplies are introduced inside the cabinet, the sterile person will actually spray them again. The cages that we used were pre-bedded with alpha dry and they will double wrapped. And this helped us to be able to spray the outside wrapping. And once it's inside the cabinet, we could spray it again and spray the inside wrapping also. For all the water that we used, uh, we used one to two liter flask and all the food was also double wrapped to maintain sterility. One of the major just adjustments that we made uh, was the use of the second person that would assist in bringing supplies in and the sterile person would always be inside handling cages. And here we can focus solely on making sure that the items inside the cabinet are maintained sterile by spraying them down. To summarize, there are five factors that we found were critical to maintaining cages germ-free. The first one is that the cages that are going to be used should be completely sealed and they should have HEPA filtering if possible. The second is that the supplies that are irradiated or autoclave should be stored properly to prevent any contamination until they are completely used up. Thirdly, there should be a sterile barrier that is kept by using the use of a designated sterile person as well as an assistant. The sterile person will spray their hands in between each cage or each item and all items are sprayed in by the assistant. Fourthly, the aseptic technique should always be used, and this is done by always spraying their hands in between their cages or items and using the proper sterilant. Uh, lastly, the sterilant that is used should be verified to have uh, certain kill times or contact times, and once it's opened, you should be able to determine the shelf life of that product. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. If you have any questions, you can contact us at the emails provided on the right-hand side. At this time, I would like to acknowledge our Jozenko Morgun team. It really does take a team to maintain these cages and do all the animal health checks. Uh, our rack is also housed in uh, the Laboratory Animal Resources Center. And this is due to our funding provided by the colleges below and the NIH funding also.